we're we're processing and executing with imperfect information because we're not giving ourselves the time to scout out. And there's a couple habits I want you to start picking up, some really good habits that I personally think every player should do. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Hello, yes. How's it going? Yes. <laughs> I'm good. What about you? <laughs> good, good. I'm glad we got things working. Yeah, I improved a lot since last session. I don't know if you remember me, but I mm -hmm. have improved a lot. Awesome. Uh, yeah. I remember a big thing was you're working on your mechanics and I, I gave you some drills and yeah. stuff like that to continue on, right? Mm-hmm. So how's tell me a little bit of how that's been going. Ready for battle. Uh I think okay, so it's been okay, so at the first like two weeks I was like getting a lot better, right? Mm -hmm. But then last week till this week, uh I I just been on the same level i don't see myself improving on mechanics okay. wise for some reason and you're you're doing all the stuff like on aim labs right so it's like tracking your your stats and stuff like that yeah okay. uh my stats are the same for like two weeks now gotcha. and I don't get more. there's any number of reasons that could be happening um starting off with straight up like you just might need a lot more time mechanics are something that are going to be always improving even if it feels like you're plateauing um there's going to be things that like maybe your stamina is building up and you're just becoming more tired over time um and you need more i mean i, I don't want to call them workouts but you need more time in those kind of training <laughs> sessions to to build up that stamina and that dexterity in your hands um it could be yeah. you might need to experiment with changing your sensitivity and finding something that suits you a little bit better it could be even upgrading your hardware maybe something like a higher f higher hertz um, monitor or a better mouse or uh, anything like that can be I holding upgraded, you back. I upgraded from 60 to 300 hertz. So. Oh, that's quite a jump. Nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's not the monitor then. Um, well, yeah, it could be any number of things. And then keep in mind also transferring those skills from just the raw mechanical practice into game setting in Overwatch is like a whole nother jump. So even if you're seeing improvement in aim labs or in... Uh, training modes or anything like that, you might not see direct results in your gameplay until you give yourself the time to translate that progress into actual ranked play and stuff like that. Um, um, everyone's going to be no. uniquely different. I would recommend first yeah. thing is experimenting with your sensitivity. I've heard a lot of people um, just haven't tried enough different sensitivities. And I know pro players who are still experimenting uh, with their sensitivities when it comes to in-game and mouse stuff. The thing is, right now, um, I feel like uh, myself, I'm improving in game, like mm -hmm. mechanics wise. But on AM Labs, I'm not improving. But in game, I'm improving a lot. So, yeah. And remind me I how long you've been playing. Uh, how long since our last session when you've been starting this training? Oh, um, I think our last session was on the 25th. Okay. Uh, so, about three weeks or so? Yeah. So it's really okay. Nice. So yeah, you're still in your first month of even adopting this training program. So like these are something mm -hmm. you you'll start measuring day to day and start measuring like month to month. Um, so like your yeah. improvement might seem stale and might seem like it's plateauing now, but if you come back a month from now and you check your check your stats and uh, check all the graphs they have on aim lamps and these kind of things, it might have seemed like a very slow but gradual increase in performance. These kind of things. It's always it's right. always a grind. Pro players have been playing this game yeah. for five years and they're still improving. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, all right. But looking at this VOD, um, what about this VOD? Obviously, uh, we'll be seeing mechanics. But what about this VOD in particular was uh, the reason um, for submitting? I sent you some notes with it. I right. Think. Uh, so I need to work on a little bit of a better positioning. I also mm -hmm. need to stop using my role as a movement ability. <laughs> and gotcha. I've, and I felt like I under-aimed a lot, so I raised my sensitivity a little bit. No, okay. no, not on this spot, but outside For future, the yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, and again, like, yeah. keep experimenting. It doesn't hurt um, in the long run, at least it doesn't hurt, uh, to keep finding what's mm -hmm. most comfortable for you. So yeah, uh, would we play McCree through all three rounds of this VOD? Yeah, uh, I basically only play McCree, so... Yeah, I, I seem to remember a lot of McCree played before. I think you mentioned some other heroes, but McCree was the focus. Uh, so yeah, we'll mm -hmm. talk about some more uniquely McCree things in this VOD. Obviously, the cooldown usage and positioning and stuff like that. Uh, but I think the best thing to do would just be get right into it. Five, four, three, two, one. 
If there's anything you want me to, to pause and talk about, as always, just let me know, and we'll go into it. All right. All right. Um, this is my first mistake. <laughs> this is so like, Ooh, you canceled the hook though. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. McCree, obviously he's not a flanker like Tracer, um, but that doesn't mean he doesn't flank, right? And so I think when you yeah. started this flank over here, this was the correct choice. You're looking to control more of the map, walking this way would have gotten you not enough value from your shots. You'd want to be able to shoot these back, these juicy backline members like the Zen, maybe the Ana if she walks up like this, and you want to be able to split pressure from the rest of your team so that they can't all just look in one direction and deal with everything you're throwing at them. This is especially true yeah. if they had a Reinhardt. If you were just matching shields, obviously you want to be able to shoot around the shield. So this is the correct choice. Starting this fight, since McCree doesn't have mobility, like you mentioned, combat role isn't really just a movement tool. Um... And the movement it does give is pretty slim anyway. Uh, it means you can't commit very hard to these flanks once you start getting challenged. What it means is you go for these short flanks, which this is a short flank, but we only hold it for a short amount of time. We either find immediate value and then maintain this pressure and keep moving forward, or we notice threats and we force to give up that position and wait for our next opportunity to flank. So I think our only problem here was just overstaying. And we saw the tracer. We opt not to go for the immediate flashbang, which is smart because we needed it for this hog, but... Yeah, this was just a little bit too late to rotate. I think by the time you were here, unless you tried to immediately get the kill on this tracer with a flashbang or something, you need to already be falling back. Okay. And given that we are running a team that's more stable, uh, and they're running a team, so just looking at team compositions for a second, since we're running a very stable front line, Ryan Zarya, and they're playing these double off-tank comps, and they've got flankers, and they've got more mobility than us, we should be expecting more split threats because they don't really get anything from putting their two tanks together. We obviously get a shield that everyone can play around. So it makes more sense for us to stay more grouped. It makes more sense for them to split up a little bit more because they don't have that that anchor tank, as they say. Yeah. So anytime you see this double off tank composition, it's just almost the same as when you're playing against like a dive team. You need to be more wary of tanks being more unsuspecting threats than just being in the in the front line kind of thing. Coming back to the fight, again, similar thing here. Does it make sense? If we're worried about split threats, does it make sense to open with this wide of a flank when we're not going to be able to get back to our team very easily? Like, unless you go and you immediately get kills and your team follows up and immediately finds value, this is going to become a very dangerous position. Just as a rule of thumb, when you are retaking in a spot like this, um, unless you've got, like, a big play to make and you're coordinating with your team, like your team's about to, like, push together on this honor or something, uh, it typically makes more sense to find more value slower and playing closer to your team but we'll see if this pays off yeah look at these shots the aim training's paying off yeah a little bit um i still can only hit body shots <laughs> it's progress. one step at a time that yeah honestly just to address the body shot thing it might just be a crosshair placement thing um this is something that's happened to me a ton in games like valorant in games that are just slightly different than overwatch in terms of hitboxes and stuff like that where I just mm -hmm. don't hold my crosser high enough for the game. And you might need to just like overcompensate yourself a little bit. And like instead of aiming, uh, the general rule of thumb is like aim at someone's neck when you're trying to hit a, a headshot. But maybe you need to start aiming at the tip of someone's head. Just making that mental difference could be like something that's holding back your 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 pattern and your what's the what's the term I'm looking for? Your habits in terms of your aiming. And again. Yeah. Given that we no longer have any pressure on point, we saw people die in the kill feed, we need to be thinking about giving this flank up even more. Last thing we want to do is just be like permanently locked into a duel with Tracer until eventually Hog comes up and hooks us like last time. Yeah, we're backing up slowly. Again, we're very eager to flank. I'm noticing this a lot. And again, <laughs> we're just ignoring the fact that we have a shield and they don't. Like, worst case scenario, if you're with... The team right now you're still shooting bodies you're not shooting a shield or anything right now like you're still able to shoot maybe this soldier maybe that the six of you it'd be better if you all went up here to this laws of soldiers something like this but like you can always shoot at diva you can always shoot a hog even if there's no other targets and you're not shooting at something like a rind shield that you need to be able to get around to find damage yeah but yeah because <laughs> like it's so easy for them to turn your 1v1 with tracer into a 2v1 versus like there's no support from your team that you're ever going to get unless you're with them I kind of messed up Ooh. here, to be honest. 
So yeah, <laughs> uh, a note for the, the sleeping diva. One, this is not optimal range for the right click. Uh, two, we were not yep. at full ammo. Uh, and three, we had the capability of closing this distance. So I think pure optimization thing here, and you don't need to do this 100% of the time, but understand like how you're going to be able to get the most damage in situations like this. Okay, never mind. You you were for ammo. I don't know why I thought you were you were down a shot. Uh, so right here, what you can do is you could you can roll. You aim for the headshot, then you flashbang, then you right click, because she's about to wake up anyway. Um, so we we can only get like probably like one shot in before she wakes up, but we can still aim mm -hmm. to make that a headshot to get that early burst damage. We flashbang to prolong the stun, and then we go for a right click. But right click, rolling into right click. Also, no reason to swing this wide when we don't know what's up there. When we don't know what kind of threats are poking from here. Once Diva's around this corner, think to ourselves, you're basically, from here, this was our space, but now you're walking into enemy space. And even though it's just okay. Diva and Soldier at this point, and you're not going to die from them directly, we're also exposing ourselves to these third angles on point that we're kind of ignoring to make this aggressive play. So oh, it's like... not that this was like a bad thing to try and chase the Diva solely, but there's, it's the other threats that are involved that we need to be wary of and keep them in the back of our mind. Okay. If it was just D.Va in that situation, uh, absolutely fine. And then obviously, yeah, flashbang out of range. I mean, it was just... Uh, I yeah. did throw it in your, hopes of... Yeah, your final breath, you throw a flashbang. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, nice. That was a uh, really bad flashbang. <laughs> Ooh, almost got her. Yeah. So we won the fight because I was playing with my team. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty good. So obviously that, and we used a couple <laughs> ultimates. Uh, I just wanted to go back real quickly. So again, yeah, highlighting, we killed the Roadhog early. Um, you got the final blow. We used a nano on our rhyme, so it doesn't really matter that he gets pulse bomb. We force out Tracer. This is actually a really good opportunity to go for this flank, because now we've forced them all into the point. This team with all this mobility is all of a sudden corralled into this tight area, so it's a lot more free to go here. You still need to be aware of the Roadhog coming back from spawn, and Tracer potentially being able to get on you, and maybe even sight lines from these people on point. Uh, but there's no mm -hmm. threat of like Tracer being back here, Roadhog being here immediately. So this flank is fine to go for. It's also a lot shorter than our flanks previously, where it's like going from here <laughs> back to your team here is a lot easier than going from here back to your team here, right? Yeah. So all these are good things. We find an opportunity for the high noon. We pull the trigger just to guarantee the kill. I like that. We didn't get too greedy with it. We flipped the point. This is is about the territory we need to be worried about this hog coming back in if we have that at the back of our mind and again we've kind of already spent all the value from this flank not only is it important to find short windows because uh, we need to be aware of multiple threats but because the enemy is going to be more aware of you over time and even if they're all stuck up here they're at least going to hide from your damage to respect this flank so you're not going to get as much value over time you go for the immediate kill on the tracer in a few shots but as soon as they've stabilized, then you regroup with your team just to play safe. Maybe look for your next opportunity from there. Keep in mind, okay. fights in Overwatch were always going to be very fluid. It's not just, we started a fight here, this is how the fight's going. It's, we started the fight uh, by killing the Roadhog, then we pushed onto point, we found a flank because of that. But now our flank's wearing out, so we need to regroup. Maybe we push a little bit deeper, and then we can find a flank this way. It's always evolving and moving forward until everyone on the enemy team is dead. And until we reach that moment, we can't uh, we can't stay in one position for too long. Yeah. Another way of thinking about this sort of concept is imagine yourself as a Widowmaker. And you, you take this mm -hmm. angle and you get a pick with your first shot. Say you kill this Tracer. Instead of a Deadeye, it's a headshot from a Widowmaker. Um, the enemy team is going to be very aware of where you are based on that shot. And you're probably going to need to reposition to find a new angle, as well as stay safe from any enemies that might try and dislodge you. So, obviously... Yeah you are a little bit more stable than a 175 HP Widowmaker, but the same concept still applies <laughs> to you. Yeah. Here as well, I would like to see you, instead of prioritizing just damage, damage, damage non-stop and getting traded up by Roadhog here, take some priority position. You've already flipped the point, 
uh, based on the kill feed alone right now, we are already winning this yeah. fight. <laughs> we don't need to make aggressive plays to to finish this fight right away. We can play this fight slower. Yeah. And honestly, it'll benefit us more if they lose this fight slower because we're getting progress in the point. If Roadhog decides to move around, choke to choke, continue touching, and then die like after 10 seconds, that's way better than us getting this kill on him right away and him just being back in spawn sooner. Mm -hmm. And obviously, worst case scenario is he gets a kill, which is also something we're, we're giving up to him. So put more priority on your own position. Since you don't have mobility, so even as much as soldier, you need to be thinking about repositioning sooner. Same thing goes on the flank. Same thing goes when we're winning a team fight. Don't stay in the okay. open just because you have targets to shoot at. Think about what's going to benefit you over time. Lights out. Okay. Oof. Because, yeah, if we all just played stable there, if you were still alive, for example, uh, and maybe we, we rotate in here and we play a little slower, we bait them into us, then with our spawns coming back and with them being a little bit staggered, maybe we can find something. Or maybe we can just even poke out the Roadhog, because, again, he's got no shield in front of him. Maybe just our damage alone is enough to force him back. All right, yeah, we're just waiting on our Ryan now. Oh, Zarya. <laughs> Good. Good flashbang. Nice job. So again, this was a good uh, little expedition to go on with your soldier because this was our space. We got a kill on their Roadhog, so they have no more threat in here, so we can do whatever we want in our space. We see an enemy um, in our house, basically, and we go punish them for it. This is incredibly safe to do because even with our Reinhardt dead, there was nothing able to contest this base. Unless Tracer's going to try. They're not even on Tracer anymore. Never mind. Uh, unless a flanker or a Roadhog is trying to get in and trying to one-shot us, um, there is no threat to us right now. And we already dealt with the Roadhog, so this was absolutely very safe to do. And I'm also glad that you're you're opting to do something with your team, with your soldier in this instance, instead of trying to just like go for poke on point, because this is something that can potentially get you punished. Okay. Oh, don't let her get mech. Okay. <laughs> oh, there's a the hug. I heard him. I heard one footstep in my ear, just barely. So again, not bad to go for this high noon. Uh, basically, similar situation to the last time, but. Again, similar to the last time, we need to have in our back of our minds this hog flank. And then as soon as we don't get value, I think even before this moment, you could have canceled it a bit early, expecting not to find any value. Uh, we should either be immediately running into our team or playing, play, playing like a safer angle over here by rotating back here. But we need to keep our threats in mind. And in addition to these threats that we're seeing on point, there's still the threat coming back from spawn. So... In this instance, I think best move would have just been to move over here with your Ana. Uh, I think moving to point here would be a little too risky unless your team goes to deal with these people first. And it seems to be we're hyper-focused on this soldier. So it's a, it's a rough spot to be in. But we kind of second-guess ourselves and double back and end up hooked out. Again, just highlighting the fact that we need to make that decision a little bit sooner. Oh, I just realized... What happened to the teams? Are there five people on each team? Where's our uh, where's our other support? And where's their other DPS? What just happened? <laughs> uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, oh, wait, their, the their DPS just came back. The, the, I don't know. People just kept leaving and then joining. I, I genuinely Ooh. don't know. Just barely got the kill. I think um, it looks like you knew that your team was following this up, so this is fine. I think he managed to cancel his hook too during that flash somehow. Uh, but a little bit scary to just roll like in a straight line. Like if you know your team is following you up, this isn't something you want to take solo. So you can play it a little bit slower again, like rolling a little bit closer to cover and then taking more pot shots and stuff like that. But you do get the kill, so not bad. Yeah, see how easy it is to just shoot when you're behind Ryan Shield? Even if there's low value targets like tanks and stuff like that, it's uh, it's free space for you. Now with two members going down, unfortunately though, it becomes a lot harder. 
this is kind of this isn't on you but this is kind of showing what happens if we if we try to play too fast so not only uh, do we lose our onto the bomb but our Zarya stayed up really aggressively when they were making an aggressive move and similar to you needing to give up a flank sooner like we saw a couple times this is when we needed to give up this front line pressure sooner so even if you were just staying with the Rhine I'd like to see you moving back with him during this moment to stay stable because they are using ultimates they are coming in they have numbers advantage inherently because our support disconnected um, and we shouldn't be trying to maintain aggression here we do get the kill but that's more because Hanzo was over aggressive himself and kind of walking in a straight line and more importantly than the kill of Hanzo we're not ready to deal with all the aggression coming forward and our Rhine goes down At this point, we need to make a miracle play happen, so we go for a flank. <laughs> Doesn't look like it's gonna work out. Oh! Oh, he tranced, of course. <laughs> so yeah, biggest story so far from your play is, well, one, your mechanics look a lot better from what I remember the last session, so nice work. Uh, but your decision making is coming out too slow in terms of when you reposition. Um, and you're also I mean, I, forcing too many flanks. Yeah, I picked up a few bad habits because I've been playing in gold for a while. Mm. Um, so we got to squash those so. as soon as we can. <laughs> yeah. Like like jumping a lot and moving, <laughs> using all as movement and stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. I never had time... those back then. Yeah, mm -hmm. roll like obviously it has movement tied to it, right? So. You need to keep that in mind, and you want to use that when you can, but typically the biggest situations you're going to use roll are when you're like rolling to close the distance to get a flashbang on someone, or when you're rolling like back to cover when you get challenged by someone like a Roadhog or maybe a Hanzo who can one-shot you. Um, rarely yeah. do we just roll around the map, or rarely do we roll in duels um, aggressively unless we can guarantee the kill with something like a flashbang or like a last shot of damage. Okay. Uh, but yeah, general note is just... We need to be thinking about position more actively. Um, so even like in a situation like this, you should already be thinking about like, okay, based on where my main tank goes, I need to be thinking about where I'm going to position. I'm not just gluing myself to Reinhardt and putting uh, like sitting on his shoulders or anything like that and just shooting wherever he goes. You're moving around him using the space he creates um, to find good space for yourself. So just as like a thought exercise right now, uh, I guess first let's see where Reinhardt's going. So our Reinhardt's going to touch point right now. Where do you think is the best position you can hold knowing that your Reinhardt's going to be contesting space like this? Um, I, I would probably go for a left side flank, like on the middle. Or like, I would say on the middle. Like on point or like all the way to the traffic uh, side? All, all the way to the big mega health pack. Like all the way over here? Yeah. Okay. And why do you feel this flank is good? Or why would um, you make this choice? Because I have cover all around me, just in case. Mm -hmm. And I also have a clear view of the enemy team. Okay. Um, what I'm worried... But... So, so you're, you're absolutely right. You have cover, you have a mega pack, you have somewhat easy access to your team if your Ryan is playing on this side. Um, but you don't have what we call like a strong angle isolation. So if the enemy team has six people right here, yes, absolutely. You can do whatever you want from over here. But if they send members to come challenge you here, um, is this a place you're going to want to be in for very long? If they send a tank, oh. especially to a space like this, if there's a Sigma out pushing you, if there's a Hog out pushing you, these kind of things. Um, what I'm worried about this kind of flank is you haven't gotten the information yet. And yeah. By, by just going, so right now, like obviously you see nothing. You see nothing from the enemy team. Maybe we can assume they're going high ground. Maybe we can assume they're going main because a lot of teams do that, but you can't guarantee that. So the only thing we can guarantee right now is where our Ryan is playing. So what I would like to see is if you want to make a similar aggressive play, start by doing it on point. If you see the enemy team, if your Ryan's matching over here, for example, uh, if you see the enemy team, then sure, you can rotate up here and maybe hold that space. If you address where Hog is, where Hanzo is, where Sigma is, these kind of things, then you can move around them. But until you take in that information, it's impossible to, it's impossible to make like the correct choice. Quote unquote, correct choice. Yeah. So when it comes to, and we'll focus solely on positioning uh, for this VOD, but this ties down to every decision from target focus to ultimate usage to everything. Uh, but when it comes down to just choosing your position, 
or making any decision for that matter, there's three steps you need to do uh, for making anything. You need to take in information. You need to process that information. You need to decide what you're going to do. And then, of course, you need to execute on that choice. So right now, we're, we're processing and executing with imperfect information because we're not giving ourselves the time to scout out. And there's a couple habits I want you to start picking up, some really good habits that I personally think every player should do. So number one thing is hitting tab 15 seconds. Uh, whenever you load into a game on any map type, the fir after the first 15 seconds, you can hit tab and you can see the entire enemy team. Yeah, I from there. That, so. Okay, perfect. Step one done. From there, you need to think to yourself, who do I not want to ca get caught off guard by? Is there a tracer who's going to be flanking around the map? Is there a hog who's going to walk up and hook me? Is there a Hanzo who's going to shoot me from across the map? Is there a Zen who's going to five orb me from across the map? Like these kind of things. Think to yourself what your most active threats are going to be in most situations. You don't need to protect everything perfectly, but in this comp, for example, I'd be worried about their hog and their Hanzo because I don't want to take a duel with Hanzo if he's long range. I don't want to get caught off guard by hog. Two threats we can just get out of the way. Now... Yeah. Before we start processing choices or executing choices based on positioning, we need to assess these threats. We need to take in information about where they are, if they've used cooldowns, if they're full HP, if they're moving aggressively or defensively, these kind of things, before we can make anything close to an educated decision. And that's where we want to get to. That's our end goal, is to make the best choice for the given situation. Um, so this is not easy. And this is going to change not only in every game you play, but in every single fight you take in every game. And this is going to change based on what heroes you're playing, what heroes the enemy team is playing, what map you're on, uh, the types of players on both teams. If your Rhine is super aggressive, you need to play a little differently. If their Hog is super aggressive, you need to play a little differently. Um, mm -hmm. So the best advice I can really give you is dedicate more time to really taking in that information really pay attention and be strict on yourself about like, okay, am I asking myself the right questions to actually come up with the right answer? Or am I just thinking of what's going to happen without seeing anything and just playing out the script that's in my head uh, and then potentially getting caught off guard by something unexpected. And I think that's a little bit of what we saw last round. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if we can, I know this was all pretty like high level conceptual stuff uh, and we'll break down some <laughs> more decisions once we see them in game. Uh, but if we can yeah. apply that line of thinking to everything we do, which is a long process, of course, um, yeah. all of a sudden we're not locking ourselves into early flanks. We're not getting caught off guard by hogs. We are finding kills with our flashbang, all these kind of things, because we were more prepared, more informed, and making better decisions. Boy. But yeah, let's get into it. So again, yep, okay. as you mentioned, <laughs> we're going over here. I know myself too much. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, this worked out. So like, it's, I can't say this was a bad play, right? But it was an it was an uninformed play, and that's what I'm worried about. Because like, does this play still work out if instead of Sigma, this is a hog, and he just all of a sudden hooks you, uh -oh. right? Oh. Like anything could go wrong, and that those are the situations we want to root. It's not just we don't want to measure ourselves by our peaks and by the fact that we just killed this soldier. We're probably going to find more kills. We want to measure ourselves by consistency and what's going to happen more often. And this is especially true once you start reaching higher ranks and players start becoming more creative with their approaches. Like, you're already reaching that point where you're you're not playing default McCree anymore. You're not playing behind shield, only shoot targets that my Rhine can see. You're looking for flanks. You're finding advantages and stuff like that. Are you going to be able to deal with enemy players that are doing similar things is the biggest question. So that's what we need to tailor our play towards. Cause yeah, like, soldiers like, he, wait, this guy's not playing by the rules. Why is he behind me? <laughs> oh, oh, but the Ana lands her shots. I think there, uh, at that point, once you've gotten the kill here, again, thinking back to like how we don't want to overcommit to flanks, anytime we're at a strong enough advantage that we're just going to win the team fight because we have numbers, you can just like yeah. completely give up your position and go regroup with your team, go get healed, go shoot at tanks and whatever else because you've already found your your advantage in the fight you've done your job up to that point now you just need to stay alive and continue being a threat okay let's start over at the beginning oh to be honest this hondo is just kind of playing a response simulator <laughs> uh, so... i think we've all had a few games like that though 
<laughs> yeah. Nice little headshot. Ooh. I keep trying to spam shots, but mm -hmm. it's no work. Okay, I like that you fell back at least. I think... So, first things first. Um, generally speaking, when you get, do get locked into a duel like this, it's, it's one thing. But then when you're choosing to push to continue the duel, anytime you're pushing mm -hmm. around a corner or through a choke, it's, you're walking into disadvantage. If, for example, Hanzo yeah. has a sonic arrow or anything like that, or he's just like pre-firing a shot, he's going to have that advantage. And since he has one-shot potential, even if you're at full HP, this can potentially go wrong. And again, yeah. since you are a low-mobility hero like McCree, unless you can guarantee this kill, which, I mean, eventually we get there. We probably could have killed that Hanzo if we, uh, if we caught him off guard with a flashbang or something, but it became really risky that whole time. And now, it's kind of just like back and forth, you guys challenging each other. <laughs> so like, he's doing the same thing. But it's like, I think it was bad for him to re-peek out here, because if you were just watching and ready to pre-fire him, uh, maybe you just hit him in the head and he's dead. But yeah, be very cautious about pushing for space solo like you were there, especially if they already know you're coming. Your best bet on McCree is to hit short, unexpected flanks. You don't have the mobility or the self-sustain to stay on the flank for a long amount of time. So you need to make sure that the short amount of time you do have um, is very valuable and as explosive as you can get it. Nice follow-up. I, I feel like I could have been more efficient if I've gone toward the other door. Like, like if you I've swung left here? Yeah. 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 I think either way is fine. I mean, you do get the kill. But here, I don't like that you just take yourself completely out of the fight. I would have liked to see you... Um, keep in mind what's going on with your team right now. Again, just focus on taking in that information. At least, like, turning around to see if, if you're getting chased or anything right now. Because uh, we just <laughs> take a leisurely stroll over to the Mega Pack. Meanwhile, our team's using ults back and forth. There's a huge brawl <laughs> happening. Kills are going back and forth. It's working out in our favor, uh, but maybe we could have been more valuable there. And again, keyword is just being more informed. This is more like a zoning ult too. Like no, that. I was about to say, I really like that zoning ult. Um, so again, yeah. you knew that you didn't want to commit to this long-range duel against the Zen. His projectiles can land luckier shots than you can with a hitscan gun. Um, and you didn't overcommit there, which was good. And then you just use your ultimate to make sure that they can't ignore you, which makes their approach slower and more predictable. All these kind of things. Uh, so yeah, overall, that was really good. But again... We're seeing some of the same habits where you're overcommitting on flanks, you're a little bit too ambitious, and you're not getting punished for it uh, to your benefit, but <laughs> it's not the most consistent play that you're making, and that's what we want to push ourselves towards. So yeah, if you are choosing to make those extended duels happen against someone like that Hanzo that we saw, make that choice as informed and explicit, explicit as possible, so that if you okay. force him back around a corner, maybe all of a sudden you, you stop for a breath, and check to see where the enemy team's at. If the whole enemy team is retreating, maybe sure you can continue, to continue chasing because you're going to meet up with your team at their spawn door or something. Uh, but if your team's getting pushed back, maybe you just give up on that duel because you've already forced them back and you can keep shooting on the enemy team uh, while you're sort of matching front lines, these kind of things. Just taking in more info, updating our win conditions, updating our decision making as often as possible. Okay. This map is probably McCree's favorite map on Oasis. Um, it's very easy to find really short, easy flanks on this map in both the right room and on the high ground. And they take advantage of that a lot. Yeah, yeah. perfect. So no, tracking no. still bad, mm. but <laughs> I think I think these shots are fine. Uh, I think what you're doing is a really good too, by the way. So number one. Uh, you have the option here of either like playing safe by this door, you're just a roll away back to cover and your supports, um, or you could go more aggressive, which based on your previous rounds, I kind of expected you to, not going to lie, uh, to go like around the shield fully or even onto enemy backline members. <laughs> what the f No. <laughs> so so th that's kind of the vibe I was getting from like the duels you were taking with that Hanzo. That was sort of like the feeling I was getting from your flex. But this is much smarter play. And again, now that they have a more stable front line, 
this is the kind of play we need to be making in order to find an advantage around the shield. So that's really good. And our pressure was good up to this point. Unfortunately, our Ryan ends up going down. Uh, I didn't see exactly what happened, but it seems like he just got the worst of a trade or he let his shield burn too early. But yeah, this position is really, really strong. We're respecting our threats. Nice. We get a little pick on the Ana. Yeah, and look, you're just, mm -hmm. you're free firing now. Yeah. Beautiful. So this was a result. So remember what I said before of you, whenever you do find the initial advantage uh, of just playing together, this is them not doing that. The Ryan fell down, which is one thing, but their D.Va just completely splits herself <laughs> from her team, allows you to take this yeah. 1v1, which benefits you because she's ignoring you. Um, and this whole time, like all they had to do was just live and they probably would have capped the point. But instead, they go aggressive. They try to take more space than they were allowed to take. Uh, and we leverage that against them. So this was really good. But also a lesson in what we, we don't want to do when we find advantages. We don't want to be pushing up and taking more 1v1s when we don't need to. Yeah. Okay, I'm, Ooh, I'm maybe like that. that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, you had already done your job. We had already found all the kills. We were waiting for Orion. To, he just got back, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and you were perfectly fine taking a few pot shots from here, but that roll is what uh, sort of sealed the deal on your death there. Yeah. <laughs> you put yourself in a situation where you needed the kill immediately, and I think even you didn't even have a chance because they killed you like during your whole animation. Uh, so <laughs> it was a rough one to come back into. Yeah. Oh, I should have stunned sooner so the honor lives. Uh, I think that honor's dead either way, to be honest. Ooh, I thought you were dead too. But we make it out. Um, even if you do stun that diva, I feel like if her boop was enough to get the kill, then her micro missiles also would have been enough to get the kill at range, or her, even her shots. Mm, yeah, I guess so. Oh, the headshot from Hanzo. <laughs> it was actually a random shot from him. I was. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that does it happen with the Hanzo. Spamming shield. Yeah. Yeah. It was this just is kind of the shield and then Yeah. Just that. Just I mean, yeah. Oh, go on. Yeah, I was just gonna say you just weren't really doing on. anything wrong. Um, you no. could have like, if I want to be really nitpicky, you could have played even slower. Wait for Orion to push up and then, or maybe even take a flank like this, which isolates that angle. Uh, but yeah. really not necessary. That was just a random shot. Got through the Orion shield as he was swinging. These kind of things happen. Good news is they committed some ultimates, which means it'll be easier for us to push through. This I like this flank a lot. So, I, note, you're allowed to go this aggressive at this point because of everything they've already committed. And yeah. um, I want to make sure that we're assessing this in-game, not just like out-of-game right now. So it's easy to say this was our choice because we can, I mean, if we turn on this, but look where all of their, where they're all pointing. They're all pointing in the same direction right now all all over here which means anything over here is outside of their field of view is not in their focus and is going to find value so good flank for this time uh yeah. it's important to note what information we can take in that led into this decision so it's not just the fact that we saw hanzo over here we wanted to go challenge him i'll put this in third person actually we can use the fact that one their reinhardt is positioned over here seeing where the enemy main tank is is usually a good tell of where their intended focus is going to be of course, there's still members okay. like Hanzo or Zen or McCree, like yourself, that are going to want to flank around that pressure. But this is where the majority of their focus is going to be, because this is where their main tank is. Same thing mm -hmm. goes when a Winston jumps in or a Wrecking Ball swings through. That's probably where the team is going to want to commit. So that's yeah. that's easy focus right, right away. Next, ultimate usage. If the enemy team is using ultimates, in any case, it's usually because they have an intent to win a team fight or, or stabilize a team fight in case of trance and things like this. And where they're using them, the Hanzo Dragons over here, the trance. Uh, I know you can't hear it on your end, but in my ear, I can hear it from my left earphone. So I know it was used over here where the main tank was, where we expected the pressure to be. So it's just another part of the equation that's all happening over here. And you don't even see player models. Like you don't even need to see player yeah. models through this wall because you can already hear and see the things that have been committed over there. Which means walking up here, and also, I mean, even seeing Hanzo completely ignore you is another good sign. <laughs> means this flank is basically free. I don't think you needed to roll here. I would have liked to save roll in case you need to get back to this cover, because it's not hard for Hanzo and Zen to just turn around. Uh, it's very yeah. possible that they do that. So, yes, 
we want to warrant an aggressive flank, but we also want to cover our bases in case they choose to turn around on us. We go for the high noon, instantly take some pressure off. Yeah, between high noon yeah. and barrage, they couldn't do cancel out both. <laughs> Making use of the beat here, walking forward. Again, similar situation. We see where their main tank is committed. We saw their soldier run away from this space. Um, again, I don't think we needed to roll. I think in general, um, unless you are rolling up to guarantee a flashbang kill or things like that, I want your a bit of your homework to be saving roll for defensive use. And not only saving it, but putting yourself in a position where it can actually be used defensively. So here, easy roll back to safety. Up here, not so much. You're still exposed if you roll back to here. So keeping that in mind that even though you have some form of mobility, it's not very strong. It makes flanks like this really good because you can roll back out, but flanks like this still risky because rolling back here doesn't really do much for you. Yeah. That's it. I was under aiming a lot in this one. Mm -hmm. I think he saw that a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, honestly, I, I'm trying not to comment on mechanics too much because you already yeah. know and you're already working on them. Um, yeah. This is a wild flank, but <laughs> oh. you know what? <laughs> it's fine. Okay. Another one no, of those situations it's where it's a little bit of un <laughs> unnecessary risk. So at this point, so when we kill the soldier, we just demech the diva. We are winning this team fight, right? I think you know this, yeah. which is why you opt to continue going more aggressive. And I think keeping aggression is a good thing. You can almost expect your team. To follow up these kills maybe not immediately like we're still cleaning up these people but the movement of the fight is heading in this direction so you are still ev evolving with the fight maybe just a little bit too quickly i think this flank is what's scariest to me although at this point seeing that they're not looking at you you can stay here a little bit but again rolling forward <laughs> to guarantee this kill on the zen is <laughs> sure good but it's also like if this hanzo didn't for some reason jump across the point and he just stayed with zen you're dead. <laughs> yeah. If this Ryan was a little higher <laughs> HP, you're dead. <laughs> yeah. oh, I'm gonna die anyway by the honor. <laughs> uh, Man, the honor seems to be the only one hitting their shots. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. And yeah, as you notice, obviously you, you had the roll, but it doesn't really get you anywhere. Um, at yeah. that point, you would have needed like Ryan to come escort you out or something. Or have them all miss their shots. So yeah, anytime we're rolling aggressively, it seems to be pretty much a mistake. Like, rolling back from spawn is one thing, because you know you're going to have it back up when you really need it, these kind of things. So save your rolls for when you're making defensive moves, or you like absolutely need a reload to win a duel, or things like that. Or when you're closing the distance to get a flashbang. Oh, Lucio. <laughs> How does he live? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Again, roll there was a bit unnecessary. I think you were just doing it for the reload. Just going forward a bit again. Uh, so this is a really good position. And like, you don't even need to walk out onto point to continue doing damage to this Ryan. Like, this is still your effective range. Um, so yeah. again, we want to talk about angle isolation. One step back. Your only target is Ryan, and I guess the soldier on the high ground. One step forward, you have three other members that you can now see between the two supports and the diva. So, yeah. <laughs> no need to overexpose yourself like this. And then again, rolling through the point like this, especially when it comes to diva bomb coming through, you'd love to be able to first assess where that diva bomb is going, roll back into cover, roll back this way into cover, um, if you absolutely need to. But all that being said, we we kill the Ryan and we get dodge the diva bomb. So, nice job. Mm -hmm. But we can be a little bit safer with our decision there. And I think okay. we would have gotten the same result, but made it more consistent in the future as well. Good roll. Uh, that was good pressure on the Hanzo. Was a bad roll. <laughs> Why was that a bad roll? You were getting out of the dragon. That's fine. Oh, wait. Uh, uh, because I don't have sound, we don't notice stuff. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah that, that's absolutely fine. Uh, and then you were moving with your team, which is good. Again, like if you were pushing this Hanzo alone, 
I think that would be too aggressive. But because you had your tanks here, like this is a guaranteed kill if he stays, which he did. But if you go here alone, it becomes like a 50-50 duel who has the better aim. Um, ways you can make it not a 50-50 is even if your tanks aren't pushing here, wait for your tanks to be pressuring the point so that maybe Hanzo's thinking of shooting your Rhine and then he's caught off guard by your flank. Or he's forced to back up because uh, Zari is now here getting pressure on him and like right-clicking him or something. Uh, and then you can also bring in a side threat. Um, when you are flanking like this, you want to make sure you're just not the first person your target is looking at. So that can either be done by having your tanks create space somewhere else on the map, or of course with your tanks escorting you uh, across the map so that you can guarantee the, the fight win. Yeah. Same thing here. This flank is now, before, if you were doing this alone, I would say you're too aggressive. With Zarya here, uh, this is free as hell. Good z final zoning high noon for good measure. <laughs> I was I want to put the shield. That's all. <laughs> yeah, I was good. I mean, we won, but yeah. I felt like I didn't deserve the wood. So <laughs> no, you hit. So number one thing you did was good damage. Um, so that's a lot of your job as McCree, and you were setting yourself up to take strong angles and stuff like that. I think though you were over committing still in a lot of situations that you didn't need to whether that was over aggressive flex or rolling forward into things <laughs> um, or committing cooldowns too early um yeah it was a lot of different things but i think that all stems from the same issue of you not trying to think bigger picture with a lot of your decisions you're not taking in the most information you're focusing on a single target a lot of the time uh, and you're focusing on a single position because in general it's good not because it's good for the specific situation and I think best example of that was like a first fight on the second round <laughs> where yeah, like you're right um, how far back was it still further back yeah. like yeah you're right this, this is a good position and you can do a lot from this position you can both shoot front line from here or go aggressive on the back line here but that doesn't mean it's good in every single situation it happened to be good in this situation which Again, I know this can be hard to sometimes see uh, in le unless we're showing direct comparisons to what actually happened in game. Uh, but I think you can imagine what would go wrong if there was a hog here, uh, if the soldier was expecting you and hit a few more shots than he did, if Sigma was here with a shield and then soldier takes the duel on you. Like X number of things can go wrong. And sometimes in fights like this, in, in Overwatch games like this, it's not about making the first play. It's about not making the first mistake. So going for a flank like this early with imperfect information is a chance to make a really huge play, but it's also a chance to make the first mistake, which opens up the fight to the enemy team. So that's that's the biggest lesson I want you to go home with. <laughs> um, did you have any uh, did you have any questions about anything we talked about on this pod? Oh, that was totally good. Um, awesome. But like, uh, I sometimes have trouble playing on maps without with a lot of high ground. Mm -hmm. It's like let's say Watchpoint Gibraltar, sure. Because you know McCree is really slow and he doesn't have any mobility, like vertical mobility. Like I don't know how to position on that map most of the time. Gotcha. So let's fly over to Watchpoint Gibraltar and let's walk through it a little bit. And I will say you picked the most complicated map to talk about, so I'm glad. Let's load in and talk about some options we have. So let's imagine we're attacking first point, right. and you're you're wondering how to get value from high grounds and stuff like that. So flying over to first point. So obviously everyone knows um, this is a map with very little flank routes, as it turns out, uh, but very important high grounds. All this space yeah. is very heavily contested, even like this bridge over here. So how can you, as a McCree, coming out of spawn, wanting to push the payload, wanting to attack, find valuable space um, seemingly on your own? So there's similar to what we talked about in that last round. You can't do anything purely alone. You can't walk into six members on the enemy team and expect to just walk onto <laughs> these high grounds uh, and them not doing yeah. anything about it. So what you need to leverage is what your other team is doing. Either maybe you're super vocal in game and you talk to some of your team members and you get them to communicate and make a six-man rotation up here or up here. That's one way. If you, if you have a shield tank like Reinhardt, that's a great way. Or even if you have something like Winston, like if your team's rotating this way and your Winston jumps and puts a bubble right here, that's some space that you can take. Um, Okay. Without team-wide communication or coordination, though, it does become a lot harder, and you need to play a little more reactive. 
one, you should play generally slower, and you should play with, with respect to what your team is doing. And the unfortunate reality is a lot of teams will just try to push the payload, which doesn't really help you on the high ground <laughs> at all. Yeah. But what that means is you can spend time doing as much as you can to get the payload, like at least past this line somewhere like here, and then maybe try a short flank over here so that any members that are caught right here or right here that are shooting down on your team as they're pushing payload are maybe within flashbang range if they're right at the edge here, or maybe you hit a good headshot to some of the members back here and at very least force them back and maybe try again with the next choke kind of thing. Other options you can do is play extremely slow, and this is part of the reason... Uh, hits can member like Widowmaker or Ash can find more value than potentially McCree because of the effect of range, is maybe you play uh, a little bit slower, you run down, you cross over here, you take this high ground, which generally is left uncontested by defenders, and maybe you, you threaten people from up here. Maybe you take some shots again. Oops, not the right button. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe you take some shots on the members over here, over here, over here while your team is pushing the payload. If your team's doing absolutely nothing else for you, you probably can't push much further than this uh, without getting poked out. But if you force anyone back, you can slowly move forward, or maybe you can drop down and rotate this way and slowly work your way through the map. The most important thing about any of this is, like I said, oops, I keep pressing the wrong button, sorry. Uh, you can't do it all alone, unless you're someone like Widowmaker and you hit like a grapple shot and then your team pushes off that, there's not much you can do alone as someone like McCree. So you need to wait for your team to be finding value and you need to wait for that value to uh, work over time. You're not going to walk up and kill six people or flashbang someone and let's like hit two more headshots and like kill the whole team and then just waltz through high yeah. ground. You need to work <laughs> like step by step by step. Yeah. And at any one of these steps, you could lose a duel you could be forced back and then go back a step, these kind of things. It can go wrong, and you need to be open to adapting to those situations. And again, mm -hmm. each one of those steps is not a solo move. This flank is not a solo move. It needs to happen while your team's pushing the cart. This push around here isn't a solo move. It probably wants to happen while the enemy team is dropping now that the payload's over here. Pushing up to this blue box isn't a solo move. It's when your team is threatening to cap the point or when your team has already pushed them off the high ground. Um, or maybe instead of there, you rotate to your team at this point, and maybe you play somewhere safer around here. And then you can even go for crazier flanks where you go like down here or up here as McCree. But all of these things happen one at a time. You can't go, if we lay it out, again, this is a very complicated map, so it requires even more effort. You can't just go from A to B to C to D. You can't just go A to D, obviously, unless for some reason the enemy team just rolls over. You need to go step by step by step. Yeah. That's the best advice I can give. And like I said, this this will be different in every single one of your games, every single team fight. Every time you're, you're coming out of spawn and trying it again, it's going to go differently. Overwatch is just a okay. very complicated and chaotic game. So nothing goes <laughs> perfectly according to plan. Um, but you should at least be trying to work around what your team is doing, work around timing your peaks, your flanks and stuff like that with your team's aggression. Um, and of course, not just ignoring the high ground and just playing solely on the ground. And sometimes, honestly, it's worth it for you to be the one pushing the payload. If you're the one as McCree and the rest of your team is like Winston, Diva, Genji, uh, maybe you just sit on the payload because if they try to dive you, you've got flashbang, you can, you've got 225 HP, uh, and your rest of the team is like dislodging all the people, and then you're there to follow them up if they drop back here or something like that. The roles can be switched yeah. in that way as well. Uh, but yeah, does that at least yeah. sort of answer your question? It does. Well, um, I don't know if we have any time left, but if we do, can you can you do the same thing for Dorado? Yeah, sure. Uh, we got a bit of time, so let's let's get into Dorado. So again, we'll probably just talk about first point, um, because first point is probably the most important point on both these maps. So Dorado, again, your options are limited, but not zero. And again, this is why you see heroes with longer ranges or more, more mobility than someone like McCree on these types of maps, because they just have more options in these situations. It's easier for a Winston Diva, sorry, it's easier for a Winston Diva to get up here and contest these spaces than it is for a Ryan Zarya. It's easier for a Tracer or Widowmaker to contest these angles uh, than it is for a McCree. But that doesn't yeah. mean you can't do anything. So generally speaking, most teams on Dorado uh, will, of course, hold somewhere around here use this long sight line, and then as the payload's pushing around the corner, we'll drop back in right here. That's pretty much how most Dorado games go, in a nutshell. Mm -hmm. um, so, of course, your first step is 
getting the payload here as attackers uh, and making sure you can dislodge these members because if they're allowed to sit up here uh, and just shoot down at you guys um, engage whenever they want take no damage it's not going to be a good time it's going to be hard to even cross this distance even with payload pressure um, so we need to do something uh, the best thing that i'd say mccree could do is do a long rotation up here this is generally uncontested space from defenders unless they are really spread out uh, and they have members both here and here this is generally going to be a relatively free rotation unless you're getting like pick from Widowmaker across the map or something like that uh, <laughs> yeah. so between you or other brawly ish members of your team like maybe someone like azaria maybe even someone like a reinhardt if they want to make this rotation while someone more mobile like sometimes diva or someone smaller like lucio can push cart and use cart as um as cover as well as doing that so again it's not just you're making the rotation alone you're making this rotation as they're worried about cart pushing up then by the time this is happening maybe you push up a little bit further and then all of a sudden you've got an angle like this onto enemies or like this to potentially get some shots in instead of an angle like this that you would just be on the ground it also opens yeah. up opportunities for you to flank across this way if they're slow to rotate if they left supports up here or individual dps up here maybe you can collapse on them up here maybe if you're if you're not here alone keep hitting escape by mistake uh, if you're not here alone if you're here with zarya or sigma or ryan and you just push these members out before they rotate again this happens in conjunction with the payload pushing maybe you catch someone off guard and you're safe to do that because you have a tank with you that kind of thing yeah but yeah again like i said this won't work 100 percent of the time and people will do things like pick you on widow or come duel you as tracer or echo and like come outplay you as you're trying to make this rotation work but it's just an idea of how you can use the map to your advantage, not just playing where the payload is, playing on the ground, because high grunts are hard. Yeah. Okay, um, once I learn, because I'm probably going to try to learn Widow, it's going to be hard, but... Mm -hmm. I, I would recommend <laughs> oh, try. trying um, Ash over Widow, if you're not 100% sold on, on learning Widowmaker. Uh, obviously, Widow, more mechanically demanding, more feast or famine type of hero. Um, and generally okay. less flexible than someone like Ash. Ash okay. is like a really good middle ground between McCree and Widow, where you don't obviously have the same kill threat, but you're a lot more survivable. Uh, your movement's a lot more flexible with Coach Gun. And yeah. you're even better at shooting tanks than McCree is with your dynamite and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if you're open to learning, like, like. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't like the scoped thing for Ash mm. because it's just. It's weird. It has a little bit of acceleration for some reason. Um, yeah, it's... I guess uh, you just have to learn that. There are some yeah. settings you can tweak that are specific. Um, if you weren't familiar with, like, scoped settings. So on Ash, mm -hmm. uh, where is it? So relative aim sensitivity while zoomed. I don't know where I got this number, but it's what I've gotten used to. This might even just be the default <laughs> number. I'm not sure. Uh, but this is good to play with as well. Um, you can find calculators online. Um, I don't remember any offhand, but I remember when I was playing this game a lot more, there are calculators online that help you get as close to one-to-one, -one, so it's like the same sensitivity when you're zoomed in or zoomed out um, that you can play yeah. with. Okay. All right. That was great. But yeah, thank you again for coming in for the session. I hope uh, I hope you got lots to work on. Um, and you're not, <laughs> yeah. You got to find some success in your future games. As always, keep up the mechanical practice. Uh, we didn't talk about it basically at all, in this VOD, but I can tell there's been improvement, but there's still a long ways to go, so keep that up. Mm -hmm. um, and just... yet... One last thing, can you please write all of they ha all I have... all the things that you want me to do, like on a message on Discord or something, so I don't forget. Yeah, you bet. And <laughs> I mean, this will be going up as a YouTube VOD as well, if you're ever keen to rewatch yeah. it. Uh, but just to lay them out right now, so yeah, keep up mechanics. That's just your, your goal until the end of time, uh, just like every Overwatch player. Uh, but yeah. when it comes to decision making, focus on taking in more information. There's times where you're turning away from a team fight when you're hyper focused on a single target or you're focused on doing something without information that all of this could just be made smoother and in the long run a lot better if you take the time to observe your surroundings, think about your enemy threats, your, the enemy team members, think about how the fight is going, where enemy team members are uh, positioned and things like that, and then work with that information to come to a better decision. This is going to take a lot of practice and time to fully trade yourself. And you might realize that you're getting overwhelmed 
uh, and feel like there's too much to keep track of in those kind of situations. Just make sure that you are focusing on at least some specific things. The enemy DPS that you've been dueling a lot, focus on what their movements are like. The enemy tanks yeah. like Roadhog who are a big threat to you, focus on where they're going to be positioned and then work your way up. Okay. All right. But yeah, thank you again. Uh, good luck in your future games. Oh. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure I'll send you that message in just a little bit. But yeah, have a good one. Yeah. Thank you and you too. Bye. All right. Peace. All right. That was our final coaching session for today. That one went really well. Uh, Fleeked met with him a couple weeks ago, like we mentioned. Uh, and yeah, seems like he's been having some pretty steady improvement. So that's really good to see. 